In this video, I'm going to take a more in-depth look at audio routing. We'll see what a bus is, why we need them at all, and how to use buses both as outputs and sends, and explain the differences between those two. I'm using the Session Drummer Track Template that I opened in the Track Template section earlier, and I have a simple MIDI drum beat set up in a loop. Let's open up the bus pane. So what is a bus? A bus within Sonar is similar to an audio track, in that it processes audio in a similar way. They can be muted, soloed, have effects on them, but there are important differences. The first is that a bus can have clips on it as an audio source in the same way that a track does. Neither does it have inputs and therefore cannot be recorded onto. Instead, a bus is selected as a destination for audio from a track or from another bus, either via their outputs or via a send. The controls are very similar to the track controls we've already looked at, but some have reduced options such as the edit filter, which does not contain the clips or transient options as clips cannot be shown on a bus. There is no record button, but in its place is the waveform preview button, similar to those on instrument tracks. When this is lit, incoming audio will draw a waveform in the clip pane, similar to how a track draws a waveform while recording, but this is not stored with a project, but just created when it is played back. A bus can have many audio sources, whereas a track only has one input, and it's this fact that makes them so useful. One very simple example of how a bus can be used is simply bringing the volume down. I'm going to open my console view in the multidock. And in a second, I'll start this drum loop playing. If I drag the fader down on the master bus, you'll hear that the volume reduces. The only way of doing that without a bus is by quick grouping all of the tracks in a project and then dragging a track fader down so all of the tracks reduce in volume. Already you can see that a bus can be a time saver, but there's more uses for buses than simply reducing volume. I've already mentioned the master bus in previous videos, and this bus is the most important bus in any project. This is the bus that outputs your main outs, from which all tracks and buses eventually get rooted. So let's look at another use, as it affects buses. For example, if we decide we need to use a reverb effect on some of the tracks, we could insert a reverb plug on each track. But then we'd have several different versions of the reverb open, which would not only use system resources, but would be a real pain if we decided we wanted to change the type of reverb used. For example, if we wanted to change from a plate reverb to a room reverb, we'd have to open each reverb in turn and change the settings. Much easier to put one reverb plug in on a bus and then send all tracks to the bus. We now only have one version of the reverb to worry about, and we also use a lot less system resources. Changes to the reverb only have to be made once. That leads us on to send buses. What's the difference between a send bus and an output bus? The simple, somewhat confusing answer is that there isn't one. It is the way the bus is used and has audio routed to it that makes the difference. In fact, it's quite possible for a bus to be a send bus and an output bus at the same time, although it's not a common scenario. The main difference between how they are used is that an output bus gets the whole signal, it's the only place it goes. A send, however, only gets a copy of the signal, and there's still another copy of that signal going to the output bus that is totally unaffected by the send. This means we can have two or more copies of a snare drum, for example, the regular as recorded version going to the output bus, and other copies going to send buses, where it's then processed in some way, a reverb bus, for example. Let's look at using buses as sends and outputs and see the difference in practice to help fully understand the explanation. We looked earlier at one of the Session Drummer 3 track templates, and I mentioned that there was some slightly more complex routing involved, so let's have a look at that and explain what's happening. I'm going to use the console view a lot in this video. We looked at it briefly in the UI overview videos. It's easier to see what's going on here, and there'll be a full explanation of it later. I've hidden some of the tracks to help keep the interface free of clutter, and to the left we have our audio drum tracks, and to the right we can see the buses. I'll start playing the project, and you'll see the meters responding to the audio. The track output assignments are visible along the bottom, and the corresponding output is in the bus pane to the right. The meters on the buses also respond to the incoming audio. The kick, snare and hi-hat all output to the drums bus, the toms to the toms bus, crash cymbal to the cymbals bus, and the percussion track, which has a cowbell on it, outputs to the percussion bus. These last three buses, the toms, cymbals and percussion, output to the drum bus, so ultimately all of the drum kit ends up going through the drum bus, which outputs to the master bus. This setup already gives us quick control over which parts of the kit we hear and process. 
If you don't want to hear the toms, we can mute the tom bus. That saves us quick grouping and muting three tracks. We can also see three buses that don't appear to have anything rooted to them. The parallel compression bus, reverb bus and the headphone mix bus. These are buses we're going to use as send buses. The parallel compression and reverb buses output to the master bus and the headphone mix goes directly to one of my pairs of main outs. The headphone mix and reverb I'll explain and set up shortly, but the parallel compression bus already has routing to it in the form of send from the drum bus. It's turned off at the moment and that's why it appears inactive. Let's have a closer look at some of these send controls. Like most controls, most of these are duplicated in a track view pane, just represented with different graphics. The plus sign to the right of the sends header allows us to insert a send and we'll see that in use shortly. Beneath that and to the left is a number 1, which is the position number of the send in the chain of sends for this buses. The lit post button shows that this send is post fader. That means that any changes we make to the bus's volume fader will affect the level of the signal going to the send. The alternative is pre fader, meaning no matter what we do with the track or bus fader, the signal going to the send is unaffected. We'll look at a practical use for that when we set up the headphone mix. The on off button is just that, an on off switch for the send. The drop down box allows us to reassign the send or delete it. The level knob controls how much signal is sent to the send, and the pan knob controls where in the stereo field the send signal sits. Ok, I'm going to start the project again, and this time I'll turn the send on. This now sends a copy of the drum audio signal to the parallel compression bus and that was reflected by its meter. On this bus we have the Pro Channel bus compressor which is compressing its copy of the signal. The compressed signal gets added back to the original when it gets to the master bus. We'll explore parallel compression more at the mixing stage but for now you should notice the drums have a little more oomph when it is turned on. You'll see that the parallel compression bus level meter reduce as I reduce the send level control. Now let's look at inserting a send on a track. We'll insert a send to the reverb bus on the snare drum. I'm going to use this to reinforce the differences between a send and an output. I click on the plus icon beside sends and select the Insert Send Assistant from the drop down list. This basically allows us to set up the buses as we insert them, but other than that there's little difference between this and inserting to a bus directly. We can set options here and I'm going to select the reverb bus. But I could just as easily create a bus using the options shown here. The pre or post fader setting can be chosen here and I'll leave the match, tracks, pan and gain unchecked because again I want independence from the main controls. Let's OK. Now let's start playback again. You'll instantly note that the snare has a huge reverb sound on it. That's the result of the send level being at unity. Even though the original dry unaffected signal from the track is still there, it's being overpowered by the wet affected signal from the reverb bus. Let's reduce the send level, and as you hear, we can get a much more pleasing reverb sound. You'll hear the difference as I turn the send on and off. So what happens if I turn our reverb send bus into an output bus? Now let's do that and find out. I'll turn the send off, and change the snare's track output to the reverb bus. I'll start playback again. Now as you can hear, the reverb is way too much and we have no control over it. If we reduce the level going to the bus, we also reduce the volume of the snare, there's no longer a dry copy of the signal. The only way to reduce the amount of reverb now is to change the level within the reverb plugin itself. Of course if we do that it affects all the other tracks being sent to it and chances are we won't want exactly the same amount of reverb on each track. So we then get back to the reverb plugin on each track scenario which introduces all of the disadvantages I talked about earlier. 
Hopefully that gives you a better idea of the differences between using a bus as a send and using it as an output. One handy trick is to either click on the track number or the bus letter while holding the ALT key down. When we do this, any buses that are connected in any way to the track or bus are highlighted as you can see here. So now let's look at setting up a headphone mix and introduce a couple more ideas. I'm going to use quick grouping to insert a headphone send onto all of the drum tracks. To do that, I'm going to select all of the drum tracks by click dragging. Hold the control key down while I click on the plus side beside one of the sends and then select headphone mix from the list. You'll see that a send has been inserted on all of the selected tracks. While still holding the control key down, I'll click on the pre-post button to make them all pre-fader because I want to be able to control the send levels independently of the main track faders. I'm also going to change the snare track send to the second bus so you can see the headphones mix there. Now let's start the project plan back again. You probably hear a little bit of phasing going on as my interface is now playing both the main mix and the headphone mix. I'm going to mute the master bus which will stop the phasing as the only bus we can hear now is the headphone mix being generated by the track sends. To show how the pre-fader option works, I'm going to use quick grouping to drag the track faders down. We shouldn't hear any reduction in volume as the faders will have no effect on the headphone mix bus send levels. Notice you can still hear that even though the faders are all now down at infinity. If I reset all of them to where they were, I'm now going to change the pre-post switch to post fader, again quick grouping them all, and then repeat bring the fader down and you'll hear the level drop as the fader is now affecting the send signal as well. Now I'll turn them back up as I'm playing back and then I'll mute the headphone mix bus so you can see that that's actually what you're listening to. If you have multiple out, this technique can be used to give musicians separate headphone mixes while a main mix remains unaffected. So for example, the bass player can have more kick and snare in his mix if he wants it, and you can set up as many headphone mixes as you have spare outputs for. Hopefully you've now got a better idea of the differences between an output bus and a send bus.